Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the White House. I hope the Secret Service was nice to you on the way in. My name's Charles Galbraith. I'm the Associate Director of the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs and Public Engagement here at the White House. Uh, I'm a member of the Navajo Nation, and I hope many of you have received the email announcements about this and the, the White House, uh, the President's Native American Youth Challenge, which we announced last summer. Uh, in June, President Obama called on young people across Indian Country to submit their stories of leadership and community service. And hundreds and hundreds of young people answered that call, submitting their stories to us. These were reviewed by a panel of government officials uh, throughout the federal family. And we came to a, a conclusion that these stories really rose to the top and that we thought that they deserved to be invited to the White House and recognized as White House champions of change. So I'd ask you to, again, give them a hand. We have some very distinguished government leaders here today that are going to lead a panel discussion with our 11 champions of change. Uh, we also have uh, a person from the director of the White House internship office here who will speak a little bit about the White House internship program. Uh, but first, I want to turn it over briefly to Aaron Hannigan, the director of the Champions of Change program. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Charlie said, uh, my name is Aaron Hannigan, and I work in the Office of Public Engagement here at the White House. Uh, I want to echo Charlie's statements and uh, thank all of the champions here uh, for being honored here today at the White House. Um, it's a very special event. We're glad that you all are able to be here and be honored. Um, today, we're honoring these uh, 11 incredible young people. And, uh, and each week, we do a Champions of Change program. This is a especially uh, great one I, I'm really excited about. Um, the program was created because millions of people across the country are doing work to improve their communities, their states, and their workplace. And this is an opportunity to, to show, uh, to step back and really honor all the work that you're doing. Uh, today we're excited to hear from these young people and not only thank them for their work, but hopefully through their stories, inspire others, both of you in the audience and viewing online, to learn from them uh, and hopefully do similar work in your communities. Um, so this is one, one step of the process, but hopefully this will be just a breaking point or start, starting point for everyone to... Uh, to do similar work. Um, so for those of you in the audience today and those of you watching online, you can learn more about these young people by going online to www.whitehouse.gov forward slash champions. And you can learn more about these champions today and other people we've honored uh, with this program. Uh, with that, I want to turn it back over to Charlie uh, to begin the important discussion. Once again, thank all of you for being here today. And thank, you, thank all of you that are watching online and here in the audience today. So thank you. We have a special guest who's here to give some remarks about an important White House program, the White House Internship Program. And I can't talk about this program without recognizing some of the interns in the room. Uh, Quinn Fitzgerald, Merritt Martin, Wesley Thompson. We rely on the interns to do a lot here. Uh, without them, most of you would probably be still stuck out on the street and I would be looking for a new job. They run, <laughs> they run a, a ton of things at the White House and have tremendous responsibilities. Uh, and we are always looking for great young people across uh, the country to apply for these internships. Uh, with that, I want to introduce Christian Peel. Uh, she is the director of the White House Internship Program. She's a graduate of Mary Baldwin College and Duke University. And she's previously worked uh, at, a, at several education policy uh, organizations, including the Har Harlem Children's Zone. Christian Peel. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here, and just special thanks to Charlie and Aaron for extending this invitation to me. Um, it's always energizing for me to be able to be in the presence of people who are doing amazing things um, around the country. So thank you so much for the work that you have done, for the sacrifices you've made, I'm sure, that no one knows about, um, and for the things you'll continue to do. It's really an honor to be in your presence. Um, I just want to tell you very briefly about the White House Internship Program. Um, the White House Internship Program is a program for young leaders who are committed to the kind of work and service that you all are being honored for today, um, the work that you've already done, and for the work that you'll inspire in your communities. Uh, the White House Internship Program, I think, 
some folks think that it's for a sort of a cookie cutter kind of person, um, but really our requirement is that young leaders who are a part of our program have a demonstrated commitment to public service and have some sort of vision for making their community, uh, their city better, uh, more fruitful, more alive. Um, the internship program has three terms. Each year we model the academic calendar. We've got a fall term, spring term, and summer term. Um, and we're proud to say that our program is more open now than it's ever been. College students are eligible. Graduate students are eligible. Young professionals who aren't in school are eligible. Military veterans are also eligible. Um, interns work in one of 16 different offices here in the White House, and I'll echo Charlie in saying that things absolutely would not run were it not for the interns who are so committed to the work that happens here in the administration. Um, interns also hear from senior members of the administration each week. The First Lady is meeting with the intern class next week. As a matter of fact, the President met with the intern class last week. Um, they also meet in small policy groups each week to discuss things like foreign affairs and communications. And then they also have the opportunity to serve uh, in organizations and nonprofits around Washington, D.C. So I ask you to join me in raising awareness in your community about this program. Um, we want the folks who don't know they want to be a part of this program to be a part of this program. Um, so if you know of other young leaders, if you all know of other young leaders, if you are interested as well, uh, please visit our website at whitehouse.gov slash internships. Um, and I thank you for your time and I hope that you continue to enjoy the time that you're here at the White House um, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. I want to now invite uh, Senator Byron Dorgan to come up and give some uh, introductory remarks. I think we all know Senator Dorgan uh, through his great work uh, in Indian Country as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian, uh, on Indi excuse me, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs for uh, four years. Uh, Senator Dorgan uh, has been a champion throughout Indian Country, uh, but his his life in politics actually started when he was not much older than many of our champions of change here. Uh, he was. Uh, the tax commissioner of North Dakota at age 26. Uh, another example of uh, young people doing great things uh, across the country. Uh, he's dedicated his life to public service. Uh, 10 years as North Dakota tax commissioner, 18 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, excuse me, 12 years in the House of Representatives, 18 years in the U.S. Senate. Uh, a prolific career in public service. Uh, but what he's done since he has left public service is start the Aspen Institute Center for Native American Youth. That's why we invited him here today. Uh, is dedicated to combating the challenges facing Native American youth. So it is a pleasure to introduce a champion for Indian country and a champion for Native American youth, Senator Byron Dorgan. Well, Charlie, thank you very much. I wouldn't have missed this. Thank you so much for the invitation and for your leadership. And let me just say to all of you, I know you've been standing for a while, so I won't be very long. Uh, this president, President Obama, uh, has distinguished himself in a lot of ways, but I have served in the United States Congress with five presidents. None have done what this president has done, and that is reached out aggressively and repeatedly, and this week is a good example of that, to say we have a relationship, we have a trust responsibility, we take seriously our relationship with American Indians, tribes, with parents, with children, and I, I'm really proud of the work he's done and Ken Zalazar and so many others have done, and especially with respect to the youth component of this. When I left the Congress uh, after 30 years, just this January of this year, uh, I had uh, some money left over in a campaign account, and I decided I needed to figure out what I wanted to do with that money. And as you might imagine, I had a lot of suggestions from people what I might should do with that money. What I did was donate $1 million to create a Center for Native American Youth. And we're dealing with a wide range of issues, teen suicide prevention, substance abuse, education, and many other things. We're also very interested in the kind of thing you see here today, and that is not just about the challenges, but about the inspiration that comes from people doing good work. There's an old saying, bad news travels halfway around the world before good news gets its shoes on. That's sure correct, isn't it? But this gets good news fully dressed, to know what you all have done. 
And we are determined to, to make a difference in the Center for Native American Youth and working with kids. We're doing youth summits around the country. We're doing a lot of things and uh, we want to work in coordination with all of you to make this a success. I am determined uh, to continue working on American Indian issues. And I thought, where to start? How about the children? Uh, and, and so that's what this is about. We're determined to improve lives and save lives. And I'm determined to showcase as well as the White House is today, the inspiration that comes from people doing really good things at a really young age to decide we can make some positive things happen for Indian youth all across America. So to you people, let me say congratulations. I've read about your backgrounds. It is extraordinary. Last evening as I sat and read about what you are doing, I thought, you know what? If you had individually robbed a bank, stolen a car, gotten arrested for drugs, you would have all gotten some public attention by now. But you didn't do bad things, you did good things, really terrific things and inspiring things. And finally, finally, there's a kind of a frame around this showcasing young people doing wonderful, inspirational things that ought to remind us that this is the kind of good news that goes on every single day. And that combination of good news is what is going to change our future. Thank you very much. Next, I want to invite uh, Hillary Tompkins to come up and, and give a few opening remarks. I'm going to ask her to stay and introduce our champions. Uh, Hillary Tompkins is a member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, you might be seeing a trend here, uh, but we, we, <laughs> I, I, I joke, but uh, she is, she's a champion for Indian country. Um, when she heard we were doing this, she wanted to be involved. She currently serves as the solicitor of the Department of Interior. She was confirmed for this job by the United States Senate in 2009. As solicitor, she is the chief counsel, the number one lawyer for the Department of the Interior. Previously, she has served as a law professor at the University of New Mexico and as chief counsel to Governor Bill Richardson. She's also clerked uh, for the Navajo Nation Supreme Court in Window Rock, Arizona. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce the highest ranking Native American in the United States government, Hillary Tompkins. Good afternoon. Yate. Uh, so great to be here. And thank you, Charlie, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you. And let me introduce myself properly following my Navajo tradition. So I'm going to say my clans. I'm a member of the Salt Clan on my mother's side. And my mother's father is the Meadow people on Navajo side. And my father is Taos Pueblo. And his grandparents are Taos Pueblo as well. And I come from Rayma, New Mexico, uh, from the Navajo Nation. And I'm just really thrilled to be on stage with these tremendous folks. I'm going to tell you all about what they've been doing in just a few seconds. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge what they've done as a group. Uh, in my culture, I learned about my own Navajo culture later in life, um, and I learned about the principle of ina, which means life's plan. And in Navajo culture, there's a teaching that you should know uh, your life plan and the direction that you're taking, and think about your future, and think about your past and where you've been, and that should guide you through life for a full uh, and strong, healthy life. And I think all of these individuals embody that principle. They embody courage to do what they believe in. They embody strength. They embody conviction to stick with, to their guns and see their vision come to fruition. And they're dealing with really important, difficult issues in Indian country, from suicide prevention, to fetal alcohol syndrome, to housing issues, to clean energy issues, to protecting the environment. These are not, uh, these are not simple issues. And these are issues that we deal with at the Department of the Interior every day. And they're taking the bull by the horns and they're grappling with these issues first and, first and, and with great vigor. Um, and they uh, also are very attuned to to preserving their cultural identity as well, which is incredibly important. And I know 
that along their life journey, the path that they have taken, I'm sure they all have stories they could tell you about obstacles that they have faced. Um, obstacles where there are people out there say, not believing in them, saying you can't do this or that's going to be too hard to achieve. Um, they, I'm sure, have stories that they can share with you about obstacles they face because of their native heritage, from ignorance to flat out discrimination. And they have fought against that, and that has not stopped their or crushed their will and stopped their passion. Um, and they all have their own stories to tell. And what I want to share with them today is that I want them to know that they are the future leaders of this country, that they all, all of you, belong in the highest echelons of American society and tribal society. You are the next generation of leaders, and I feel your strength, your conviction, your power, helping me move forward in my journey. So we're all connected, and I'm just so pleased to be with you all today. And now I'm going to share with you, and you're probably so tired of standing up here, I'm going to be really quick, um, uh, all of you, what they've been doing. So we're going to start here with Teresa Baldwin from the native village of Kiana, Kiana, and Sitka, Alaska, who started an organization focused on preventing suicide. And then we have Morgan Fawcett from Tlingit, Haida, in Fort Thank Jones, you. California and he helps to educate others about fetal alcohol syndrome disorders, especially among Native youth. And then we have next to him, LaVon Thomas, who is Navajo, from, and he's at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's actively worked with the Navajo Nation government to promote green jobs and development in the Navajo Nation. And next to him, we have Madeline, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce this, <laughs> Say it? Say it. Say it. <laughs> Who is Mohegan uh, and is at NYU, and she has worked to keep her tribal ancestry alive through storytelling, plays, and poetry. We have Desiree Via from Kulua, Kaloa. Kaloa, Hawaii, and she is an advocate to reduce the high rate of homelessness in her home state of Hawaii. Then we have, and I don't think these are in order for the folks standing, is it Iku? Iku, yeah, Iku Beck. Iku Beck, who is Blackfeet from Missoula, Montana, who's an advocate against bullying and creating a program that works to educate young people about bullying and violence. Then we have Emmett Yepa, who is from Hamas Pueblo. Emmett, where are you? Right there. Um, from Hamas Pueblo, New Mexico who's an environmental advocate in his home tribe and has focused on the importance of recycling. <laughs> Next, we have Lorna Her Many Horses, who is from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota and is dedicated to honoring American Indian soldiers and veterans and has helped to produce a translated version of the Star Spangled Banner. Next, at the end of the row, is Tiffany Calabaza, who is from Kewa, New Mexico, or Kiwa, Kiwa, New Mexico, and has helped to bring renewable energy technology to her hometown. Then we have Cassandra Steele from right here next to me from Pinoleville Pomo Nation in Ukiah? Ukiah. Ukiah, California, and works with a youth group to preserve their culture and also <laughs> to help improve the lives of young people in her community. And last we have, but not least, we have Dallas. Oh, Duplessis. No. Duplessis. I was close. Yes. Duplessis. Uh, an Alaska native from Tulalip, Washington, and is an advocate for healthier eating on her reservation and has also started a youth gardeners club. So please join me in congratulating these champions for change. So now I'm going to ask the folks who are standing to come off the stage to your left, and then we're going to start with the first panel. Okay, can everyone hear me? 
So first, I want to start um, on my right with Teresa. And I want to hear a bit about your work uh, with suicide prevention and um, what you have done to raise awareness for this very important issue. OK, um, that's a good question. I would like to first start off of why I'm doing the suicide prevention work. As you may know, Alaska has the highest suicide rates in the nation. And I've personally been affected by suicide. Um, I dedicate all of my work and efforts into suicide to one of my really good friends that committed suicide last year. And so it's really heart touching and it's my healing process to do this. And I travel around the state of Alaska to raise awareness about suicide. And I've recently got a $25,000 grant and I'm traveling around Alaska and sharing my personal story, training um, teachers and students about the efforts and how we should raise um, suicide prevention awareness. I think that's incredible that you're doing that and it takes a lot of courage. And I think people can um, understand these issues when they come from the heart and when they're based on your own experience. So I think it's so important that you're giving voice to this issue that has um, really disproportionately affected uh, communities in Indian country. So thank you. So Morgan. I'd like to ask you about how you've been personally affected by fetal alcohol syndrome and the work that you're doing to raise awareness, um, particularly among youth and through music, to um, gain uh, or to educate folks about what this important issue is. So before I start talking, I do want to say, if I offend anybody with my words or make any, mis any mistakes, please forgive me. My mother drank during pregnancy, and I live with many physical and neurological disabilities. When I talk to the youth, I use this real literal statement. Every aspect of my life has been affected by alcohol. Every moment of every day, I'm affected by alcohol. And because of this alcohol exposure, I live with many, many difficulties in my day-to-day -day living. And it in my life, I require a lot of assistance. And to be quite frank and open about the subject, it's very difficult for me to be here and be recognized as the sole person doing this work, because I am not the sole person doing this work. I have a network of family and friends that help me every day. So it's very hard for me to be singly recognized. But the work that we do is we go around the country, and I speak on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and how it has affected my day-to-day -day life and how my family and I have worked to overcome my disabilities, what we've seen as a success, what we've seen as failures, and suggest other possibilities and other ways of living and dealing with FASDs, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And I do this by speaking in high schools, middle schools, um, and I don't limit myself to the youth. I go into colleges, medical facilities, because there are many systems out there that deal with the youth, juvenile justice, justice departments, social systems, medical systems. Everybody needs to be aware of FASD. Because the key to overcoming fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is understanding. If we can all understand how alcohol affects each individual, we can better provide the services that they need. Thank you, Morgan. Um, and I think one of the things that really struck me in what you were saying is that it's so critical to have family and community to support you in your efforts. Um, and again, I think your, your candor is really refreshing because um, most of us who have uh, family in Indian country have all dealt with tragedy, tragedies associated with alcohol. Um, and it's a very serious issue and it's a very um, real issue, everyday issue uh, that folks face. So thank you for your candor and, and um, I think you're, you're really giving this uh, important issue uh, 
some a voice, and that's really commendable. So on my left is my Navajo brother here. <laughs> um, I don't know, are we related? I'll find out, right? <laughs> More than likely. Yes. Um, so, Levon, after you tell us your clans, because we, we need to know if we're related or not, um, I want you to, to share with us the work you're doing at the Navajo Nation, um, building, uh, building awareness and uh, educating folks on renewable energy efforts and um, your studies at MIT, which is very impressive. That's, that's an incredible institution to be learning at. So, um, Levon, please. Yate, Shay Levon Thomas in Chia, Glasche in Ishle, Kiani Bashishin, Twitzel near Dashache, Tachi near Dashanelle, Twitisa Dan Nasha. My name is Levon Thomas. Um, I'm from Wheatfields, Arizona. I, um, I go to, uh, I'm currently a student, an undergrad at MIT, uh, senior. And to address what um, you mentioned or what you said, uh, so um, during my studies at MIT, I became more involved in a wide variety of projects. I started off with um, Formula SAE, we built a, a car to race, and then I got into bridge building, and then I got into all these kind of random things in between. And um, I ended up taking time off because I just needed time to just kind of see what, what I was gonna do, what, what was gonna happen, and um, so I went home, and I had an internship lined up, and I got into developing uh, wind energy on the Navajo Nation. So we were looking at developing a 500 megawatt wind farm, and um, so I, I got involved in that, and I got involved in the politics. I got involved in how, how the nation works. And then I met a group of people who were also looking at doing green jobs, but they were looking at um, more of a community-based or a, a yeah, community-based um, organization or community-based uh, businesses, et cetera. So I got involved with them and we kind of pushed some stuff and the Navajo Nation Council passed a legislation to start um, what's called the Navajo Green Economy Commission. And so once that was done, um, I ended up applying for that and I act, I'm the youth representative on the commission. So what we're trying to do right now is we are, um, we're, we finalized a lot of our, um, our policies, et cetera, and we are trying to start up with uh, community-based, small-scale type of projects. So weatherization of buildings, um, uh, small-scale solar and wind for grandma and grandpa who live 25, 30 miles off the grid and they can't afford for a power line to be brought to their house. Um, anything from that to uh, kind of like a farmer's market type of deal where farmers who actually who farm on the land, they can bring their food and people can start like a co-op and sell to the locals and kind of get some of the economy started stimulating. So just, just a transition from the coal-based economy that the Navajo Nation currently has to something that is more beneficial for the people and the land. So. And I think I need to um, ask you to apply to the Department of the Interior for a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th those are the issues we we're dealing with at the department in terms of how do we expand um, the opportunities for clean energy development and how conventional uh, energy development like oil and gas plays an important part in our, our economy, but it's also important to look to the future and see where these alternative energy opportunities are available. And Indian country presents um, a great, uh, great opportunity and place to explore those, those things. And so you're really uh, leading the charge um, and, and also engaging in tribal <coughs> government issues. Uh, which, which we know can be challenging at times, and, and so uh, I applaud those efforts. So that's great, and we're not related, by the way. <laughs> okay, um, Madeline at NYU, you've been doing a lot of work on telling stories about uh, your tribal ancestry and your tribal language, Mohegan language, um, through 
poetry and, and through acting. So tell us a little bit about how you, you go about that process. Well then, uh, akwai tonka tayo, nui swanka chokais, nata ay mahikso kio kuchi socha mangas. Uh, my mohigan name is Achokais, uh, and I'm Mohigan. Um, I feel like in a lot of situations on the Northeast, we have this uh, extra problem that I discovered when I got to NYU, which is that people don't really uh, believe we exist still. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm get a little when I try and speak. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but uh, I feel like language is uh, one of the biggest barriers within that um, framework in terms of the fact that because first contact, <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I understand. <sighs> because first contact, um, happened there, uh, we were quicker to lose our languages, and then because of that, a lot of the complexity of the language that went with it uh, also disappeared um, around the same time, and it's a, it's a very deep struggle to try and uh, reappropriate those, those meanings. So the two projects I'm working on uh, right now are, um, I'm working on an adaptation that I'm uh, directing of, um, that I'm creating and directing of uh, William Shakespeare's The Tempest, in which the native characters are given their own language to speak, um, to uh, examine how that uh, shifts the power dynamic, and um, also a, uh, an original play about um, the life and times of my ancestor, Fidelia Fielding, uh, who my middle name is named after, um, who is the last fluent speaker of our language, and how that dynamic um, would exist when, uh, especially at a time when, as is constantly the dilemma, uh, when trying to survive in Western society, you know, it's thought that certain things have to be given up in order for the benefit of the future, um, what that uh, incredibly difficult situation would have been like to um, be the last one who had this worldview um, at a time when everyone else was telling you that it's, it's not necessary anymore, it's not, it's not what's uh, appropriate anymore, and it's time to move on, um, what that would be like in contrast with now the struggle to um, revive the languages. Um, and it's, it is, it's very, uh, it's very interesting um, work in terms of uh, the struggle for language revival and uh, the meanings that go with it, but it's very complicated and mm -hmm. difficult and I don't know, I got off track and I don't know what I'm saying anymore. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're saying a lot and I think yeah. you're, you're making a very important statement about which I personally can relate to having been um, adopted from the Navajo Nation and then being raised in New Jersey, southern New Jersey, uh, and being in the Northeast. And I remember growing up and a lot of people saying, you know, oh, you're an Indian. Mm -hmm. I thought all <laughs> Indians were dead. Um, and kind of having this mythical view of me, <laughs> like I was an apparition yeah. that came up from the ground or something, can, can I touch you kind of thing. <laughs> so um, I understand that and I think um, the, th the theme throughout this panel is this, the concept of um, what I view and I talk a lot about being on a path and I think for many Native people, at least for my, in my experience and I see this, it's, it's a desire to get back on a path of strong cultural identity and strong um, sovereignty and, and getting on that path that somehow um, we've gone off on, on another direction from other influences. So I think that's a very important message. So thank you. Um, Desiree, why don't you tell us a bit about your important work in combating homelessness in your state of Hawaii, where um, there's been a, a very, very high levels of homelessness among your um, community. So tell us about how you've been doing that work. Um, I'd like to start like Morgan saying that it definitely is a community effort. Um, and I got involved because literally I was, um, I was living on the leeward coast um, of Oahu and I was traveling about an hour, hour and a half to work every day on the bus and along the leeward coast all you'd see is tents, right? And 
I kept thinking, where's the ohana, right? Where's the family? Um, the Hawaiian culture is very community. Um, and the leeward coast is actually less developed, so it's still very strong community. Uh, and then I got involved with a project working with those in transitional. So in Hawaii, we have a two years. For those who are homeless, they can, at very like minimal um, living costs, live in these transitional housings, help them to build assets. Um, and while working in that, it's funny, I read, <laughs> I read the little blurb about me and I kept thinking, all those great things came from the community, right? Um, I would do financial literacy workshops. Um, and part of the financial literacy workshops, I'd have kind of like, what are they saying about you today, right? Like, what are they talking about homeless in the news? And they would tell me things like, Des, they don't know me, you know, the legislators, the senators, they don't know me. Um, and I was like, so what do we have to do, right? And it was, it's hard for me to say that I'm a champion of change because they're really the ones that initiated it, right? They're like, Des, we want to talk to the senators. Des, how do we get there and how do we make it understandable? Um, so yeah, I mean, my work with homelessness is really just listening to their needs and helping them find the resources. Um, there are resources out there and it's, it's hard to maneuver the system sometimes. And um, I've been speaking with them about how there is a bit of an identity crisis with Native Hawaiians. And I think because we're the highest statistics in like we're at the highest percentage ethnically in prisons, right? We're the highest percentage ethnically homeless. We're the highest percentage, and there's these stigmas, but it's because we are, we have that lost sense of identity because our kupuna, our, our ancestors, they are amazing planners, right? They worked with the land. They had amazing systems, um, just such great knowledge, and... Uh, I feel blessed to be able to work with the homeless. I actually focus on housing issues in general now, um, trying to get people back on our trust lands. But yeah, that's kind of how I got involved and how I got started in the work I do. And I think, first of all, you, you understate your contribution. Uh, and we all know that. So, <laughs> um, And I think one of the important things you say is that you listen to them. And I think a part of leadership and uh, being a vehicle for change is to listen to the affected community that you're dealing with and understanding their issues um, in a very you know, deep sense, uh, not just on the surface. And uh, it sounds like you've mastered that at a very young age, and that should be commended. So, well, I, I understand why all of these folks up here are, are champions. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time, five minutes. Um, okay, so I just wanna open it up then to a general question, which is what would you tell a, a young person if they were wanting to start their own initiative? And what do you think um, is one of the lessons that you have all learned uh, through your experience? Um, and I'm opening it up to anyone to jump in. Um, okay, so one thing I've learned is that, um, I mean, if, if one person feels strongly about something, then there is more likely, most likely, someone else or more people feel the exact same way. So if, if, if a young person feels passionate about developing energy or suicide or something, um, suicide prevention, um, diabetes, health, et cetera, there are, there's definitely a lot of other people that feel the same way and um, my, my advice would say, put yourself out there. Um, say, at least let people know, hey, this is, I feel strongly about this. I think we should do something about it. I don't know what, I, what we should do, but, and, and just start getting people together and then a plan and people will come together and a plan will eventually come, come to fruition. Um, okay, I'd like to add on. I think that you shouldn't wait last minute to really get in touch with your community. Like, you know, 
it takes time and it takes effort to get things started, but in the end, it, it really is like a really good feeling. And you know, some people say that, oh yeah, suicide doesn't affect my community. Well, what, what, is, what are you gonna do when suicide really does affect your community? You know, you can't wait till it happens. You have to start before it happens, so. <laughs> when I started this work at 15, my major involvement was I came up with an idea. That's it. I had an idea. And I brought it to the p important people in my life, who were my grandparents. Somebody that I felt could get something done, had and knew a way of making something happen. So I think one of the most important steps that any youth, any leader in general, whether you're um, 15 or 60, is to be brave and to be strong, and stand up. If you have an idea, even if it's just a vague idea, if you have an, a passion to step forward, be brave and be strong, and say, I want this to happen. And then don't let that passion die. Don't let that idea float aside. If you want something to get done, you have to be persistent. You have to be determined. And you have to let your passion burn like a fire upon your heart and let it rule your actions. And to the panelists and any other leaders out there, Okay, anyone else? I just want to say, in response to uh, part of your, both of your earlier comments about that, I think that's one of the greatest things when you do have an idea about being part of a tribe, is that you have the tribe. Like, chances are someone will support you, mm -hmm. and you have that really strong, great community within which to do it. <coughs> yeah, um, definitely one, no one can do it alone, right? Um, it definitely takes the community, it takes a tribe, it takes a village, it takes the world really to create change. And yeah, don't give up. I have, um, I mean, I work with people who constantly come, you know, barrier after barrier, right? I can't do this because of this, I can't do this because of that. And I'm just like, anything's possible, right? Maybe you can't by yourself, but you can with someone else or you can with five of these guys, right? You can do it. So I like that, yeah, community and that fire, that passion that we can definitely do anything together. Well, great. I think that's a nice sentiment to close on. And I want to wish all the champions the best of luck on your journey. And I know you are, this is just the beginning for all of you in your leadership. So let's give them a round of applause. Give us a moment, we're gonna switch out the panel and then we'll start with the second panel. <laughs> All right, we're going to begin as soon as people are seated. Well, 
I assume that all of you in the room felt the way I did about the first panel, and I'm sure you'll feel that way about the second panel, but uh, in politics there's sort of the give and take and winds of change and so on, and there's now some folks in politics who seem to feel we're all in this alone. But of course we're not. And the message from the first panel, and I expect from this panel, is we're all in this together. And so uh, this panel, like the previous panel, has some uh, young people that have done extraordinary things at a very young age. And my expectation is this is just the start of their careers in uh, doing things that will affect the lives of others. And I'm going to ask you some questions about the work you're doing, but, but before I do that, I want to ask you uh, about uh, whether any of you in organizing for uh, oh, the issues of bullying or recycling or honoring veterans, wind energy, uh, tr tribal traditions, dance youth groups, uh, healthy eating, and so on. Uh, in, in organizing for that, have any of you used the social media? And, it, and so the question is, how many of you are on Facebook? Let's see some hands. Let's see some hands on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. And how many of you Twitter or tweet? <coughs> so we got one one person that tweets. All right. But but isn't isn't it interesting that that we live in a time of social media where they can communicate with each other in a nanosecond, no matter where they live, and they can communicate with a lot of people in their area to care about what they care about and find people that come to the same kind of interests and concerns. So. Let me ask some questions and to tell you that I'm impressed with what you've done. Uh, Iku, is it Iku? Yes. Okay. Um, you are from Missoula, Montana. That's a neighbor of North Dakota where I'm from. And um, you, you are doing work in organizing and advocating against mm -hmm. bullying and, and, and dealing with violence prevention and so on. What's the origin of that? Can you tell us what, uh. what, what develops this passion in you? Okay. Oki, nistuni taniko ikutsimiski maki ikitami ksistiko. Good day. My name is ikutsimiski maki. I go by Iku. Much easier to say. Um, and as you can see, I get my pigmentation from my German father. However, <laughs> my mother's family comes from the Blackfeet Reservation, which is in northern Montana, and my grandmother's name is Angeline Wall. Um, so with that pigmentation or that appearance of being white comes this exposure to the intense racism in Montana towards Native Americans. Because as I am no longer looking like I am a Native American, I am able to hear everyone speaking about other people. And, and so as I grew up in Montana, I could, um, Montana is, uh, the majority of Montana is white, although we have seven reservations. Um, the Native Americans are relatively isolated. And in Missoula, we have over 90% of our population as white. And so there's a lot of ignorance that comes with that because their only exposure to Native Americans is through maybe Pocahontas or <laughs> the, the media that's out there on Native Americans. So there's a lot of racism in Missoula. And so being exposed to that as a, as a younger person, I found um, how much bullying was surrounding racism. And, and so when I, when I got involved with the organization that I partnered with for this project, I saw their workshop model and how, how much they opened up the dialogue about different issues and allowed people to learn about the races, about the sexes, in order to um, take away that barrier of, of lines, so. That's really, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this since I was 11 slash 12, so middle school. <laughs> middle age. <laughs> but but you, you do have a very unique perspective on this, I mean, it, it, which is interesting. So you, you hear things and see things that others don't mind you hearing and seeing because they don't, they don't necessarily view you as an Indian, do they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think everybody on the panel probably understands the, the, the words she used about racism and some of the, the concerns that, that, that she expresses. And we'll talk a little about that. Let me talk to Dallas down at the end. Hi. We're just a couple hundred feet away from... Uh, from the First Lady's garden, I think. You know, she plants a garden. Yes. And then she comes out and gathers some fruit and some vegetables and so on. And, and you're about gardening and healthy eating and having the community play a role in all of that, right? I was going to ask you, how do you get people to like green vegetables? But I won't ask you that question. <laughs> but tell, tell, me, tell me what comes from this issue of healthy eating dealing with obesity and all the other things that come from that is so important. How did, you, how did you get interested in that? Well, 
My mother and my father have taught me about healthy food since I was young. Um, they gave me the option of eating ca candy, but they, they informed me on it, and I said no. <laughs> you, this is an American first. You said no to candy. <laughs> of course, it's a treat once in a while. So. <laughs> and so that began the work that you're engaged in, uh, concerned about gardening and healthy eating. Yes. Do you want to confess that there's any green vegetable you don't eat? Probably not. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I think with, with the rates of youth obesity in this country, this is such an important area, eating healthy and, uh, and growing the food, gardening, because it does bring communities together. So thanks for your work. And uh, Lorna, uh, right here in Montana. <laughs> Lorna, you're engaged in something very different, that is honoring Indian veterans and you translated the Star Spangled Banner to native language. Uh, tell us how you got interested in that. What, what, per, what piqued your interest to uh, do something to honor veterans in your community? Um, well, growing up I sang the Star Spangled Banner at a lot of different events um, in my community. If there's a basketball game, a football game, um, if they just wanted someone to sing the Star Spangled Banner for whatever event it was, um, I got asked to do that a lot. Um, and I heard it sung once in Lakota, but was unable to learn it. And um, once I went to college, I just decided I was taking the Dakota language, which is a different dialect of my own language, and just decided that I was going to translate it so that I could honor those Lakota veterans and soldiers um, and also give it back to the youth. Because for me, it was it really bothered me that I couldn't sing it in my own language. Um, I went to these events and sang to honor our veterans, but was only honoring them the way the United States government, um, the, the song that they used to honor these veterans. But um, as a Lakota person, I feel that our Lakota veterans uh, and Dakota and Nakota veterans needed to be honored um, based on their identity as Native people. They weren't just these veterans. They, they were the people who have been here forever. And I wanted to honor them as that, but also as veterans. And, and look also at how these people who come from, who come from uh, this ancestry of warriors who, who've been fighting and are still fighting every day to maintain who they are, to honor them, not just as veterans, but as Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. I think the highest rate of enlistment and service in uh, America to defend our country is among American Indians. Yes. Um, if you compare the population or the percentage of po the population in the United States of American Indians to the percentage of the population of those who enlist in the military with, for American Indians, the statistic is like the, the, st the amount of people in the military is much higher than those of us who are or who identify as American Indian within the United States. How does the Star Spangled Banner sound in Lakota? The same, but with different words. Different words. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of veterans that I've spoken to have said that, that they like it better that way because it feels, it feels better because it is more of a part of who they are. If we had time, you know what I would ask. <laughs> but we'll wait. Uh, let me, in 30 seconds, just tell you a story, though, for all of you. Um, I was asked to pin some medals on an American Indian in a VA hospital. And um, he fought in Africa, in the Second World War, Africa, all over Europe, had a distinguished record, never got his medals. And about 10 years ago, just before he died, uh, at a VA hospital, I pinned the medals on his pajama tops. He was dying of lung cancer. And he, he lived in poverty most of his life, but he fought for this country in the Second World War. And, and when I pinned the medals on his pajama tops, as they cranked his bed up to a seating position, he said to me, this is one of the proudest days of my life. Never had much in life, but served his country. And you'll find that all over this country on Indian reservations. People who served didn't ask questions, just said, I'll go. So thanks for honoring veterans. A Couple people at this table are doing things that are in some ways related to me. Um, 
recycling and, and wind energy, for example, kind of are, are in the same genre. And uh, Emmett, uh, recycling, uh, your tribe uh, is working to create a recycling system because of your, your stimulus. I mean, you, you got people interested in that. Um, tell me how that happened. Where would your interest come from? <clears throat> well, it began all in the summer of 2010. Uh, a group of friends and I were attending summer school, and our topic that we were discussing was on environmental issues. So then from that, we learned about a lot of issues, like there's a big garbage patch in like the oceans, the sides of Texas are bigger. So we wanted to find solutions to the problem. So a friend and I were at, a, at another Pueblo, and we saw a recycling bin there. We thought it was a great idea, and we wanted to take it back to our Pueblo, which we have our feast day a week or a week or two after their feast day. So then we went to the tribal administration asking if it would be um, a good idea if we can follow through with our plan. So it was a tedious process, but we got through it. So then from that point on, we had been able to get our own bins, put them around designated areas within our Pueblo. And our ultimate goal is to eventually have our own recycling center. We try to educate the youth and also the elders because the elders are the first ones to teach us about recycling, but in, but in a different way to keep our, our Mother Earth clean. So with that, we have had the motivation, we have the motivation to try to succeed to get our own recycling center, even through all the problems and um, challenges we face with like other youth, they tend to, I guess, try to put us down because there's, there's never been recycling in our Pueblo before and it's basically new to them. And with that, we're trying to teach everybody on what to recycle, how to recycle it, because the nearest recycling center is um, 45 minutes away, so. It's, so yeah. it's really hard to change behavior, isn't it? Especially yeah. bad behavior. And, and by bad behavior, I mean just throwing things away and not caring about protecting the environment and so on. It's hard to change. Is that what you found? Yeah. But you push, and you've got to yes. keep pushing. Yes. What do people think of you for pushing? Do uh, you get upset? <laughs> no. Do you, organize it, do you organize on Facebook at all? No. Could you do that? I'm, I'm sure I can do that. <laughs> And the reason I mentioned it's similar to wind, I kind of view wind energy, uh, Cassandra, and, uh, and, and recycling, both very protective of the environment. You're producing energy in a way that just gathers energy from where the sun shines and the wind blows, right? And, and recycling is the same thing. So uh, you're working on wind energy issues, right? Um, it's actually, we built a, a, like an eco-friendly prototype home well, we started on two, but we're getting to work on four for um, our tribal citizens. Um, they use solar energy, uh, rain, rainwater catch systems, gray water systems, composting toilets. So everything is environmentally friendly in the homes. And the physical design is um, culturally inspired by our roundhouses, which we do a lot of uh, spiritual ceremonies in. I confused a bit of your work with Tiffany's work, I think, but, but um, um, tell me about your work in solar, what you're trying to do with solar energy. Well, we install them on the homes, yeah. so every, uh, everything, um, all electricity in the homes will be run off the solar panels on the roofs of the homes. And Tiffany, you're working on wind energy. Um, renewable energy. Or renewable and solar. Yeah, solar. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, so it was the summer after my junior year. I was trying to figure out what to do for the summer. I was five months pregnant with my son, who is now 15 months. And so I was like, what am I going to do, internship or 
you know, just kind of loaf around and enjoy my pregnancy. But I'm not used to that sort of thing. Just, you know, um, I am always academically involved with something. And so I stopped by my advisor's office. Um, I attend Colorado College. And I was like, what can I do? And so it just happened that a student um, at CC found two solar panels in the basement of our chapel and basically just dropped it off at the environmental department. And so she's like, well, a student found these panels. If, if I give them to you, can you figure out what to do with them? And so I was like, yeah. And so um, I had just taken a class where we were introduced to uh, renewable energy technologies. I can't remember what the class was on top of, on the top of my head. So, And then um, from that point, I returned home. Um, I started talking to people. I talked to my dad, and I talked to a couple of relatives where, about where we thought we'd have um, best use of the solar panels. And so um, I got in touch with the Giwa Livestock Association back at home on the reservation, and they expressed that um, only at the time, only two of the 10 windmill sites were working and functioning. And so um, that contributed to um, um, a really small supply of water that farmers and ranchers had for their livestock. And so I was like, OK, well, I've, I've seen that you know solar panels can be used to pump water from the ground. And then um, from that point, we moved on to actually you know um, networking with other people on how to actually, you know, get the, the project going because there's a lot that's entailed in the project as far as getting the pump, you know, having the solar panels, getting the connections right, and like, and I was just barely getting into my major at the time, and so I had very little knowledge of um, what it is to be an environmental chemistry major. And so it, it took a while, and in January, we're actually going to finish the installation of the solar water pump. And there are a number, number of people that are involved in the project. And so it, it's been quite challenging. So, but we're almost there. That's, I had that you, you were uh, converting a community windmill, right? Yes. Into a, a solar water pump. It, it, that, that is really interesting and technical and challenging. And I, it, it, it's interesting to hear all of you, all of you are doing something that comes from a passion that was born one way or the other, right? I mean, you've decided, here's what I've got to do. I've got to make this happen. And, and so you're out pushing and prodding and getting people to help you. And the, the common theme among this panel and the other is that, that none of you do it alone, but all of you make it happen. Without you, it doesn't happen, but you can't, make it, you, you can't do it alone. And that is such an important lesson. I want to ask a question of you and, and the other panel as well, just a show of hands. Uh, Teresa uh, uh, described the issue of teen suicide, which, uh, which I think is, uh, amidst all this inspiration, it's also one of the significant challenges on our reservation uh, that I and others are working on. How many of you uh, know of friends or acquaintances uh, in your peer groups that have taken their lives? Yeah. I mean, it's almost unbelievable, isn't it? And, and it's, it, it remains one of the significant, significant challenges for all of us to work on, in addition to all these other things. Let me ask a, a more general question of this panel, because you're, you're working on very different things in, in some ways, however, related just to a passion to change things on your reservation. Um, what do you think um, are the, the, the challenges to accomplishing your goals? Are, you, you know. I, Lorna, for example, you, you've met the goals at this point in translating the Star Spangled Banner and reaching out to veterans, but there's so much more to do to say to those veterans, you know what, you really matter to America. Our, our culture and our country honors your service. So that all of us have much more to do. What are the challenges in, in accomplishing that? Do, uh, is it money, manpower? Is it infecting or, or, or convincing others that your idea is something they ought to sign up to and make a part of their lives? What are the challenges? Go. Oh, I can speak to that. Um, well, yeah. it's very interesting because usually it's not the youth in my case that is the challenge. And it wasn't the money either because I received a grant from America's Promise Alliance and AT&T for my project. So I already had the money all figured out beforehand. But it was really difficult for me to um, 
convince administrators and teachers of the importance of letting their curriculum slide for a day in order for us to do a workshop on bullying prevention and violence and prejudice reduction. And that's been an issue. I also um, work all around the state with this um, workshop model. And that's been an issue everywhere we go is making sure that the teachers um, let their curriculum slide for one day, give up the valuable one day of their curriculum and their test prep to let us work on this issue. And it's, it's, um, it's a challenge, but we've been able to overcome it mostly. We, we also have a, a harder time getting teachers to be trained themselves because they're, they have this fear that um, because most of our, our workshops are led by youth, they don't want to be taught by youth because there's a fear of, um, of being taught by people who are younger than you. So those are some of the challenges that I have faced. Anybody else? I can add. Um, as far as um, the project planning that went for the um, solar installation, I had to overcome a barrier of communicating with um, the tribal council or tribal leaders from my pueblo. And that's absolutely important to any project that you're gonna do on a reservation because to me, it's absolutely important to educate everybody around you so that there's no conflicts of interest or people are doubting you. I think educating um, people at that level in the tribal government is absolutely important so that they can, you know, get on the same lines as you and um, educating them about, like, a new technology um, and telling them, you know, maybe this is better than the windmills because the windmills weren't working, they're having to, you know, repair them um, several times out of the year, and now none of the windmills are working. And so that's one of the um, challenges that I, I had to overcome and um, educate people and, you know, kind of just keep this transparency between the college, myself, myself, and the, the people at home. And so I, I kind of felt that I had to fulfill that, that gap between the college and other organizations that come in with their expertise and try to help us out with these sort of projects. And so um, that was one thing. And then the other thing is um, from doing this project, once it's finished, there's going to be other um, questions that arise on like, you know, well, how are we going to um, start fluctuating the, the cattle around the rangelands and that sort of thing. And there's been conflicts of like, um, people not getting online with that. So the next step is to educate the actual ranchers and farmers, like what's good. And um, so, and another thing is, um, I'm, I'm looking to apply for a grant too. So if anybody has <laughs> any contact information, that would be Never miss helpful. an opportunity, <laughs> Tiffany, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, most of, uh, most of the, the uh, young people on the other panel and this panel, Hillary, were, were, uh, are either in college or will likely be going to college, uh, MIT, Colorado College, NYU, and so on. That, that, that is so unbelievably important. And yet, my guess is a lot of you will have friends on the reservation that didn't find the trip lever somehow, and, and they will remain back probably live a life in, of, of some poverty, uh, have difficulty finding work and so on. Yet, yet you, get, you, you got off to go to MIT. What an unbelievable institution, right? And, and, and most of you have found that trip. What, what is that, that that has somehow enabled you to, to go off and go to college and be involved in all the things you're involved in and others just not finding that opportunity or, or not even understanding that, that it is an opportunity. Any ideas about that? Um, I'm actually studying well, education in college and plan to move back home and teach. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot of different problems. The education, especially on reservations and with um, native people all over the country, whether it's an urban setting or a reservation. Um, and I think that part of it is, um, not encouragement, because we have, we have a lot of families who are like, oh, you need to go on and get your education, but it's kind of planting that seed. And in, in a lot of our communities, I don't feel that we have, we have the, the role models that we need, um, especially, especially Native role models. 
you go to a lot of these reservations, a lot of people teaching our children are non-native people who don't know what it's like to live on a reservation, who don't know what it's like um, for these youth growing up. And I think that that, I, I don't know if it discourages the youth, but it, it doesn't, it's not as realistic because they don't, they don't have the role models that, that are like them, that really know their life stories. Um, and I think that, that that really holds them back. And, and one of the biggest things is getting people to return to those reservations if they do go off and go to college or if they go off and start a business. Like, you can bring that back to the reservation. I know a lot of the time, a lot of the time it's very difficult, but we're the people who can change our community. And it, it can be hard whenever you've gone off and seen something completely different and something where there are maybe more opportunities or more people who have been educated to the level you have. But I think in the end, it's, it's also really encouraging to go back and see those youth that, that are doing something that really are encouraged to go on and, and continue their education. But there, there are a million different problems um, in the education system on its own. But when you look at that in terms of the reservation, it just, there, there's so much more. Uh, Dallas? Yes. Are, are you in college or not yet? <laughs> not yet? You're in high school. I'm a freshman in high school. Oh, you are. Well, <laughs> what college would you like to go to? <laughs> you have a lot of time then. Um, that, all right, so I'm not so good at guessing ages. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, you're going to, what, what are your plans? You're freshman high school, you go through high school, go to college, you think? Yes, I want to go to uh, college. I want to go to Harvard, Harvard. And after that, I plan on becoming a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, when I suggested you all aim high, Dallas, <laughs> Dallas took that really seriously. <laughs> Good for you. You know what? The only limitation is the limitation you put on yourself, honestly. I mean, this book is yours to write, and you'll decide what chapters are what and where you're headed, and good for you. I mean, the Supreme Court thing might be a little bit different uh, in the sense that a president has to actually reach out and choose you, but, you know, you're pretty close to the White House at the moment. You might want to, <laughs> might want to stop over there and lobby on your way out of town. <laughs> It's so probably a little early, however. Yeah. That, does anybody else have any? Yeah. What's that? You have a role in confirmation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah um, I'd like to add on that because um, where I'm from, we have a high dropout rate in uh, alcohol abuse, and um, I think that's our main problem of back home why everyone's dropping out is because they see it happening around them over and over and they just don't think they need to go to college and um, or they're unaware of how to um, like enroll their self and stuff and don't know who to ask, don't know where mm -hmm. to start. Don't. And then um, a lot of times they're uh, discouraged also because um, in my community I live in a small town and um, deal with racism, racism a lot. Um, I did growing up. Uh, I, told, I was told um, I wasn't going to graduate. Uh, I wasn't going to make it. The school board told my counsel, or my counselor, just let me, just let her drop out. They all do anyways. And um, I finished early, two months early, um, worked my butt off. And at the same time, I um, started this youth group because that discouraged me that they would think that, that I couldn't make it. And um, I was just gonna drop out. I, it was gonna be too hard. Um, I wasn't gonna do it. So um, that's what made me wanna start my youth group because um, I had, well, my mom had went to school. She went to college and stuff. And uh, she's hit the tribal leader conference. And um, she pushed me a lot and I'm thankful for her because uh, like I said it, we have a high dropout rate in my area and um, it just made me realize uh, I was lucky to have a parent like that and then a lot of us uh, where I'm from didn't have that and um, so yeah I'd like to oh 
Yes. Sorry, I'd like to speak to Cassandra's point on high school graduation too. I work with uh, Graduation Matters Missoula, Graduation Matters Montana, and also I'm on the board of directors with Ad America's Promise Alliance and working with the Grad Nation initiative. And um, it really is the school environment that um, and the culture in the schools that causes a lot of dropouts in my opinion. So one of the things that I focused on in my project was creating a safe school environment so that people would actually want to go to school. And one of the problems in a lot of reservation schools, or at least in my reservation, is there's so much violence that people don't feel safe going to school anymore. And so I've been looking at that and, and the, um, the vital components to an effective secondary education, setting you up for post-secondary education. And I feel like a lot of reservations also don't have um, those resources that come in and teach people how to apply, how to work the common app and all the complications with scholarships. And so it's really, it's really the preparation in high school that um, allows people to have that post-secondary education. So growing up off of the reservation, because I live about four hours south of the reservation, I got the opportunities from living in a university town to learn how to apply to universities. But a lot of reservations don't have that resource. Well, you know, I ask the question because I, I see Hillary here, who's the highest uh, ranking official in our country, coming from uh, an Indian heritage. And, and the question is, how do, how, do, how do some move up and, and have those opportunities and some stay back and never do? And you, you said something, Cassandra, that's very interesting to me. Uh, the, the pejorative of someone saying, well, let her drop out. They all do. That that, that that's a, that's kind of a a racism that's cloaked in language without race. But but I understand what that means, and it's so sad. And education is the origin and the foundation for almost everything else. Education and a passion. And you're all gonna you're gonna matter in life. All of you are, and not just in your life, but in the lives of others. I mean, I can just sense it here. Charlie, how much time do we have? Uh, Okay. All right. I, I, I want to just let, let me cl close by just telling you a one-minute story. I, I mentioned to yesterday at HUD to a group I spoke to, but I, I was at a college uh, some years ago at North Dakota State University talking about Pell Grants because there was a proposal to cut Pell Grants, which helps poor kids go to school, kids who don't have any resources. And at this meeting, about 80 people, and way in the back of the room, a young man stood up, and I didn't know who he was, never met him, and he said, my name is Les LaFontaine. He said, uh, I'm an American Indian. I'm from the Turtle Mountain tribe of Indians. I'm the first person in my family to be able to go to college. I'm able to go to college only because of Pell Grants. We have nothing, have no money, so I'm here. I'm going to graduate from this college, and then I'm going to go back to the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation and teach school, a little like Lorna described. Well, I talked to him afterwards. I was so struck by his statement in front of all these people. I said, why don't you come to Washington, D.C. and be an intern in my office for three months? And he did. He came and was a, an intern in my office. Then he went back, finished his education, first in his family to get a college degree, Went back to the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation. The next time I saw him, I was on the reservation, and I was in his classroom that he was teaching. Became a teacher. Next time I heard from him, he called me, and he said, uh, I wonder if you would come to the Turtle Mountain Reservation and campaign for me. I'm running for the state senate. Of course, I went up and campaigned for him. The next time I saw him, I was speaking to a joint session of the North Dakota legislature, and he was the youngest North Dakota state senator. He made it happen in his life, then made a difference in the lives of others. Children in the classroom, people of North Dakota, and the fact is that it, it is born of passion and belief that you can do anything. There aren't limitations except those you impose upon yourself, and when you see limitations on others, you work as all of you are working to eliminate those limitations. So I'm, I'm just proud to be here today and, and to to see some really extraordinary young Americans. Uh, you ought to be front page headlines all across America. You just ought to be. And uh, I think in some ways you will be in your lives. So thank you very much. Charlie, thank you, and thank the President for allowing this to happen as well.
Well, I have what has to be the worst spot on the agenda is having to follow these two panels. I, I don't know what I can say uh, that hasn't been said already. It, it is incredible. Uh, it's been an honor to, to be able to be here and, and hear you share your stories. Uh, it is the, the purpose of the Champions of Change program. and You are an embodiment of the program. Uh, we have many people to thank here. Uh, Senator Dorgan, Solicitor Hillary Tompkins, I'd like to thank National Congress of American Indians for their support, uh, the Aspen Institute for Native, uh, Center for Native American Youth. But I think most importantly, and this was a theme that we saw throughout, is that none of us walk alone. We are all part of a community. We are all supported by our families, our parents, our grandparents, our brothers and sisters, our friends. So I think we need to give a round of applause to the support community that's in the room. <laughs> sure. Uh, we've had um, some themes in this, and, and I'd, I'd like to point out that uh, in this program we received hundreds and hundreds of applications. Uh, one of the hardest things I've done in, in my job was having to narrow these down. Um, but we've seen that the people here are representative of Native youth across the country. Uh, their stories, what they're doing, uh, if you're passionate about one thing, we heard somebody else is passionate about it as well. And from all the other people that aren't here today, I think we need to give a round of applause as well, because these people are representative of everybody doing great work. <laughs> uh, some of our, our stories were born of tragedy. Uh, alcohol, suicide, bullying, racism. Others, we see uh, people looking to build to the future, renewable energy healthy foods, uh, recycling. And we see these themes uh, across the best of Indian country. And these are the things we want to highlight. This is the reason we have Champions of Change. It's the reason we invite these, these outstanding young people to come here and share their stories. And we're going to push their stories out there. We encourage everybody to go to whitehouse.gov slash champions. We'll have YouTube videos of this up. And we want you to share these with all your friends, with your Facebook friends, with your Twitter friends. Uh, and from here, we're going to invite everybody to go over to the West Wing and do a Twitter Q&A uh, with uh, one of my bosses, John Carson, the Director of Public Engagement at the White House. And tomorrow, uh, you're all invited, and I hope you're all coming, to the third White House Tribal Nations Conference that President Obama is hosting. He's invited one representative uh, of every tribe to attend this. And we thought this year that it was important to also invite representatives of the next generation, the next seven generations. Now, uh, this is you. And this, these representatives uh, will join tribal leaders from across the country tomorrow uh, to hear the president speak about issues affecting Indian country. Uh, but what we see for you in the future is not just the next generation of tribal leaders. Uh, we see the next generation of doctors, lawyers, congressmen, senators, Supreme Court justices, Dallas, and one day the first Native American president of the United States. And with that, I think it's time to wrap up, and I want to invite Lorna to sing for us to close. Lakota ka dokota ka nakota kichita kihana ka wakayanja kihana wichawa kichi loa. So I, I sing this for our Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota um, veterans and soldiers and also our children. We are ye ha dakun la pihe. Thank you.